It's an honor and a pleasure for me to introduce Deborah Tannen. I've known her for over 40 years, dreadful as that seems, uh, since before she came to Berkeley as a graduate student. She arrived in 1974 and earned her PhD in 1979, in the same year joining the linguistics faculty of Georgetown. She's written about 25 books for academic as well as non-scholarly readers, over 100 papers, uh, op-eds and such, uh, and has been the subject of innumerable media interviews. That's just a bare bones outline of a remarkable career. In describing Deborah's work, the word important springs immediately to mind. Now, linguists reflect on what words mean. What do we mean when, it's, when we say that a linguist's work is important? Uh, I recall a book I last encountered a very long time ago, The Important Book by Margaret Wise Brown. Uh, it's a children's picture book that considers, in language understandable to a small child, the difference between the important property of a thing and its more peripheral properties. So for instance, here's a segment. The important thing about a spoon is that you eat with it. It's like a little shovel. You hold it in your hand. You can put it in your mouth. It isn't flat. It's hollow. And it spoons things up. But the important thing about a spoon is that you eat with it. In other words, the most salient quality of spoons is what they do for the humans using them. So then, what's the important thing about language? And what makes linguistic work important? Well, the important thing about language is that it makes us human. It has nouns and verbs and adjectives. It's built from sounds and words and sentences. It uses grammatical rules that predict what we can and can't say. And there are a great many languages that may be very different from one another. But the important thing about language is that it makes us human. And it's that aspect of, of language that Deborah's work has addressed. And that's why her work is important. How does language enable us to be the creatures we are? Uh, social, cognitive, creative, scary, weird, loving, hating, the whole human project. And if we're so smart, why do our linguistic practices keep tripping us up? Why do we misunderstand and misuse, even with the best will in the world? And how do the physical and social contexts in which we use language create, sometimes res resolve those problems? Consider just as a kind of, as like they like to say nowadays, thought experiment, uh, how you might try using language to accomplish a seemingly simple task, like expressing a desire, stating an opinion, making a request, what available choices would work for and which would work against you, depending on who you are and who you are speaking to? For instance, are you male or female? Are you both co-workers? Are you professors and students? Are the people you're talking to your family members? Is your relationship equal or hierarchical, close or distant? And furthermore, are you in this act that you're uh, engaging in? Are you doing something easy or complicated? Hint here, it's never easy, no matter what you think. Um, is it in a social or a professional setting, and of which kind? And how are you engaging in this interchange? Is it orally, face-to-face, -face, on the phone, and what kind of phone? Uh, in writing, like old-fashioned snail mail? Anyone? You know, can anyone remember the last time they wrote a letter, put a, in an envelope and put a stamp on it? And yeah, you people look like you're about my age. <laughs> so yeah, we can do that. But, or is there, did you perhaps, uh, are you perhaps more comfortable or forced to use some newfangled way? Perhaps something we don't really understand yet, email, Facebook, or Twitter, for instance. Deborah has addressed all of these questions and innumerable others. How do we do language? What do we need to know to get it right? Why and how do we get it wrong? Deborah's answers are always profoundly insightful. Today, Deborah Tannen will, Tannen will speak to us on one of these topics, one that uh, we find, all of us, certainly I do, find especially vexed and vexing, conversation on the small screen 
talking over social media. And I know that all of us will emerge more knowledgeable and confident users of language, and hence better humans, um, after her talk. So, Deborah. Thank you, Robin. Um, I got my PhD in linguistics at Berkeley, really, thanks to Robin Lakoff. Uh, it was Robin who inspired me to go into linguistics. It was because of her that I came to Berkeley. And everything that I'm going to say to you today, you can trace to things I learned from Robin. So it's an honor and a personal great pleasure to be introduced by you. Thank you. And I want to thank the Hitchcock Committee <clears throat> for inviting me to give these lectures. It's quite a few years since I was here, and I guess some things are different, but it also feels very nostalgic, very much the same. And, um, and again, a great pleasure to be back. So as you heard, I've spent the last about 40 years uh, studying the language of conversation. And I'll say one last thing, I think it was about in the 1970s when I got into linguistics that many fields were turning to analyzing everyday interaction. So linguistics previously had been kind of formal and kind of abstract, at least the major branch was. Uh, and, and Robin Lakos' work was really crucial in turning attention to the language as it's used in everyday life. And that was what attracted me to the field. Well, conversations now take place over screens, over social media. So at Georgetown, I teach classes on analyzing conversation, and I had to move toward looking at conversations that are taking place on the screen. More and more conversations are taking place that way. Everything we say has a message and a meta message. The message would be the meaning of the words. If you know the language, then you would know what that is. But what we really react to is what we might call, what I sometimes call the meta-message. And it's a term I borrowed from the anthropologist Gregory Bateson, though he used it differently. So the meta-message is, what does it say about our relationship that I say these words in this way at this time? How do I mean what I say? It's like a superordinate message telling you how to interpret the words that you just heard. Well, we know that in face-to-face -face conversation, it could be by various implication, tone of voice, facial expression, um, are you taciturn or, or loquacious, uh, and a whole range of ways of speaking that I've spent a lot of time thinking about and writing about. When you talk to somebody over a screen, now, I'm not talking about Skype and, and uh, FaceTime, but when you're typing messages over the screen, you don't have the facial expression, the tone of voice, laughter, smiling, uh, all those other things that will communicate how you mean what you say. So how are meta messages communicated on screen? Uh, and so that's a bit of what I'll be talking about today. Uh, so I'm going to be giving you a series of examples. They are all real, natural occurring. Um, interaction. Um, as I said, I teach at Georgetown, and I teach a class in the use of social media as conversation, and I also teach a class called Cross-Cultural Communication. And in both those classes, I have students each week observe interaction and bring in some examples of interaction that they participated in, and they write it up, they describe it, and they analyze it in terms of their own uh, experience and, and what we've been describing, what we've been studying in class, the theories and methods we've been learning in class. And so all the examples that I'll be giving you today are either those that students brought in uh, or a whole, uh, many of them also come from examples um, that I use in my book about women friends. It's called You're the Only One I Can Tell Inside the Language of Women's Friendships. So those are the sources of those examples. So it's either people I interviewed for that book or students that brought examples into class. In both cases, if I'm using their language in this way, I got permission. Uh, and I also cleared with them exactly what I'm saying about them, and they um, approved that I've, that I've pretty much got it right. Uh, so I'll be giving you these examples, talking about them. I'll be focusing in particular on differences that tend to vary by gender and sometimes by generation and other influences as well, but mostly gender and um, 
generation. Uh, you've probably been hearing a lot of criticism of social media being used for interaction. I think many people feel that it's degrading relationships in some way. And, and my inclination is always to maybe ex, ex, um, defend the underdog, you might say, uh, or maybe just as linguists, we want to know why people are, do, are using language in a particular way, how are they using it, but we're not so much in the business of saying this is good and this is bad. But I will be pointing out what I see as some of the uh, advantages of using social media to communicate and also what some of the liabilities are. Um, a question that often comes up, is it more distant or more intimate to communicate in that way? I'll be addressing that question toward the end. Um, and, and how is it really changing our way of being in the world? Um, the examples that I'm giving you are going to be mostly of text, even though I know that much of what is being communicated now in these conversations would be pictures. Uh, and in fact, this is a change that I've seen over the perhaps five years that I've been teaching this course. In the beginning, I would say, well, you know, at least everybody's typing and they're typing language and using language. And now more and more it's pictures. So it's emojis and bitmojis and memes. But I'm going to use examples mostly of text because I'm looking for the ways that language is being presented um, and framed by the meta message. Um, you know, I first started to think of uses of new media as parallel in many ways to patterns that I ha had identified in studies that I was doing of everyday conversation uh, by the frequency with which I heard people accusing other people of being rude. And that's how I really started in my work analyzing everyday conversation. I talked about something that I called conversational style. Um, as I said last night, my, my dissertation was a comparison of conversational style of people from New York compared to people from California. Uh, and there were many ways I had encountered where ways of using language, which were considered quite polite in New York, were seen as rude in California. And it made me think about what are the ways that we um, come to assume language is either polite or rude? And I started hearing things like that about social media. So many people my age were frequently frustrated by younger people, very often it was parents frustrated by their children, because the kids would be texting under the table while we're having dinner and they should be communicating with us. And it's rude to be texting when you're in communication with me. Um, and I heard complaints that kids are rude because they don't answer the phone and they don't, often don't listen to voicemail uh, and that seems rude. At the same time, I hear younger people telling me that it's kind of rude to call people on the phone. <laughs> it's intrusive. You know, you don't know what I'm doing. I might be busy. If you really want to talk on the phone, you should text and ask me if it's convenient to talk now. And when kids are texting under the table, often what they're doing is avoiding being rude to their friends because there's an expectation that you're going to answer a text quite quickly. And when you think about it, why should your friend wait for hours to know what time you want to meet her when you could just take a couple minutes and answer the text? So these senses of what's rude and what's polite vary very much by generations in the uses of social media, all very parallel to the kind of thing that I was talking about and writing about in everyday conversation. So I want to talk about some of the features of speaking over on, on the screen that are parallel in some way. Um, Pacing and pausing is something that I have talked about that I actually mentioned yesterday as well. Um, how long a pause do you expect between turns? Depending on the part of the country you come from, you may expect a longer or shorter pause between turns. What is a normal pause in a texted conversation? How soon do you expect somebody to return the text? When do you start thinking you're, you're communicating something negative because you're not answering me? Um, somebody that I interviewed for the book about women friends was telling me about a friend who stopped talking to her. And then she followed up by saying, she didn't answer my text for two days. 
So a two-day delay in answering a text was equivalent to not talking to me at all. Um, I was also somewhat amused by a young woman, again, college student, um, who told me that she expects her friends to answer quite quickly, and if the friend doesn't answer quickly, she'll call her on the phone and say, answer the text, please. <laughs> now, it blew my mind. She's got her friend on the phone. <laughs> Why not ask her whatever it is you want to ask her? But no, the conversation should be taking place on text. This, the friend violated the norms by taking too long to answer. She wanted her to fix it, but answer on the phone. Um, something that I talked about in everyday conversation that has become quite, quite significant, I think I'll be showing you in examples of new media. Something that I call an enthusiasm constraint. Many of us assume that to really believe somebody means what they say, there has to be a level of enthusiasm. Um, I first thought of this in connection with cross-cultural communication between Greece and the United States. A Greek woman that I had interviewed was telling me when she was young, if she asked her father if she should go to a particular dance or something, if her father said, if you want, you can go, that meant she shouldn't go. If he really wanted her to go, he would say, yes, you should go. So there was a level of enthusiasm that she expected to know that what was said was really meant. This is something that varies very much by um, gender in social media. And so I'm going to start showing you a series of examples where you, we see the, how, are, how is enthusiasm expressed uh, using these uh, written messages on screen, and also what are some of the gender differences. Um, someone named Susan Herring has written far more than I have about gender differences, so if you're interested in pursuing that, you can uh, follow up some of what she's written. So all these examples come from field notes that students of mine wrote. They brought in the examples wrote about them and have approved the way I'm talking about them here. So the first one is um, an exchange that took place between a young woman who was a student at Georgetown and her brother who was a student at a college between Washington where Georgetown is and New York City where they were from. And she was proposing that she would visit her brother on her way home for a break. So she sent this message to her brother. Hey, so I have an idea for President's Day weekend. And he said, oh God, you and your ideas, what is it? It's a kind of sarcasm, playful teasing that is not unusual for uh, guys, more common among guys than girls. She said, I'm gonna go home from Saturday to Monday, but what do you think of me coming to visit you on the way back? She meant on the way there. Uh, I can take the train and stay over Thursday and Friday night. We can do something fun during the day on Friday. It's supposed to be really nice out. He replied, okay, cool. Thursday is fine, but I have a club baseball tournament I'm leaving for Friday. Oh, okay, well, we can get dinner and go out on Thursday then. Dinner sounds good. I'll pick you up at the station. Wow, good thing you sound so excited. Can you perceive and had you yourself thought that he sounded less enthusiastic than he should? I'm real curious, how many of you thought he isn't all into this? How many of you thought, sure, he thinks it's good, it's good. he's on board, that's about half and half. And he said, what, sorry, I am, I am. <laughs> and she commented that she was later convinced that he was enthusiastic about it. He wanted to introduce her to his friends, which he did. And she concluded that there was a gender difference going on. That for him, sounds good really meant it's good. For her, it would not mean that. And, and the next example is going to show you what she might have expected and what the young women that brought in examples were more likely to do. Um, so uh, Jillian and uh, Kimberly were friends and previously had lived in the same dorm, so they saw each other quite often, and now they're living in different dorms. So Jillian sent this message. Hey, so I haven't seen you the entire week, and I really miss you. So you have capitalization, entire, and repetition of letters. What are you doing tonight, tomorrow, for meals? Sorry, I had a missed lunch yesterday. But really, this needs to change because I miss McCarthy 8, that's the dorm, only because I can't just stop by your room to chat. And Kimberly replied, 
I miss you too. <laughs> Multiple exclamation points. Are you going to Justin and Lance's tonight? Slash, want to do din tomorrow? That slash is very interesting. She means slash, in other words, here's, here's a, an option. And people often say that we type things to save keystrokes. But using a slash would have been fewer keystrokes than writing out the word slash. Uh, but I think what she's doing is writing what she would have said. They explain to me they say that sometimes. I can't wait to catch up on life, exclamation points. Now, when Kimberly turned in this uh, email, this uh, exchange, and, 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 and analyzed it, what she said was, I wasn't all that excited about seeing her. <laughs> I just knew that I had to use multiple exclamation points or she would have thought that I was unenthusiastic and not eager to see her. A student told me that her mother would start text to her by saying hi. And she had to tell her mother, please add eyes. <laughs> because hi with one eye sounds cold. There are many other ways that people start, but it's got to be something special that shows you are enthusiastic. Yo, with extra O's. Hey, with an extra Y. And some people do spell it with an A rather than an E. I think there's a tendency often to change things a bit just to be creative. You could have hey with, a, with an exclamation point, and you could have yo with an exclamation point. But you've got to do something to show some level of extra enthusiasm. Um, a mother gave me this example of how she interpreted her daughter's use or not use of exclamation points. So this situation here, the daughter was in high school. She was a member of the soccer team. The soccer team was going on a away trip. And she knew that the daughter had some concerns about the bus ride for various reasons that had something to do with what was going on among the girls on the team. So the mother texted her daughter, bus ride OK? Multiple, multiple question marks, speaking her daughter's dialect. The daughter said, yeah, no exclamation point. <laughs> No need for one, haha. -ha. <laughs> In other words, things weren't going so great. Um, the haha -ha is great. Uh, I always have a unit in class where we bring in, students bring in all the different variations on haha. -ha. When do you say ha? When do you say ha ha? When do you say ha ha ha? <laughs> when do you use a smiley? When do you use a meme? And I could give a whole talk about that, but. Um, so it's her way of saying, I'm not entirely serious about what I just said. It's <clears throat> exactly these ha-has and other variations of it is doing exactly what you would do by tone of voice if you were speaking to somebody uh, voice to voice. Um, here's an example of a woman who uh, one, there were two friends. One sent the other a picture of earring she had just bought. And this is what her friend replied. Oh, OMG, oh my god, multiple exclamation points. They are so, 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 so gorgeous. Multiple exclamation points. Just so you, capitalization. And so perfect, multiple exclamation points. Absolutely beautiful, multiple exclamation points. Um, how old do you think the person is who sent this? She was a woman in her 50s, a physician one of my sister's close friends. And I was with my sister when she bought the earrings, sent her friend a picture, because her friend knew she was looking for earrings. She wanted to tell her I found the kind of earrings I was looking for. And her friend sent this back. And I said, I have to use this. <laughs> Please ask her for permission to use it. And this is what her friend replied, and my sister passed on. Of course, as long as she recognizes that the note was really an intentionally funny exaggeration. Uh, and that is one of the things that I'll be saying about these uses of new media, that they're, uh, it's, it, it's used very creatively. And I think people are aware that they're using it creatively. And it's fun to use these uh, funny markings and um, creative uses of exclamation points, capitalizations, and repetition of letters. Um, so when the sister didn't see all that, 
she thought that her brother was feeling negative and he wasn't. Sometimes people can use leaving out these things to be intentionally negative. And so this next example was, um, the situation is, bunch of girls were meeting somewhere, they were gonna go somewhere, and somehow it ended up that most of them went away, and one of them, the student who was in my class, she's the one who wrote about it, her name was Jackie, uh, was left waiting for the one latecomer. And she sent this text to her friend. Thanks for waiting for Emily with me, that's cool. No punctuation, no capitalization, no exclamation points. Jackie, I am so, 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 so sorry. <laughs> she needs the capitalizations and the repetitions and the exclamation point to show how badly she feels about leaving her. I thought you were behind us in the cab and then I saw you weren't, multiple exclamation points. I feel so bad. Catch another cab and I'll pay for it for you. The repetition of the letter U at the end was very intriguing to me. When you re, when you see the repetition of O on I'm so sorry, you think you you feel like and I did when I read it draw out that sound I'm so sorry, I don't think this should be read I'll pay for it for you. <laughs> the repetition in itself shows uh, enthusiasm and and that you feel strongly about what you're saying. No, it's fine. We are walking. Seriously, Jackie, please get a cab. I feel so bad, exclamation points. We are walking there, it's fine. <laughs> and of course, you know it's not really fine because she doesn't have those markers of enthusiasm. Next couple of examples are cross-generational, really misunderstandings in how these kinds of punctuation uh, markers are used. This was an example from a student. Uh, her, she had gone out to a dinner for a restaurant to celebrate her birthday. Her father knew that, and her father sent her this text. How did dinner go? And she said, it was so good, we went to paparazzi, and exclamation points in both cases. Wow. When the student reported it, she said to her, the three dots after wow means I don't really mean wow. It undercuts what you said before. So wow dot 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 means couldn't you have done better than that? And she commented in her analysis of it that her father had a habit of signing texts, I love you dot dot dot, which to her meant I don't really love you. <laughs> Undercutting what had come before. When I saw this example, I suddenly understood something in an earlier example that I had ignored, I hadn't paid attention to. Uh, this was Sarah's reference, uh, response to her brother. Wow, good thing you sound excited. Dot, 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 you don't really sound excited. Wow, dot, 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 I'm underwhelmed by your reaction. And I had missed it because frankly, I didn't understand that dot, dot, dot undercuts what's said before as, as this uh, young woman's father also didn't. Um, another thing that is different across the generations is the use of the period. Uh, so this was in a um, text that a young student in my class got from her mother. Uh, mom texted talk in 30. And the student name was Rose, said I'm free now and in three hours. <coughs> and her mother replied, now. How many of you got the impression her mother's mad? So did Rose. <laughs> she thought, uh-oh, what did I do now? And she was pleasantly surprised. Nothing particular, mother just wanted to talk. Her mother put a period now because it was the end of the sentence. <laughs> when young people use a period at the end of a sentence, it usually means you're angry. Otherwise, you have no punctuation. So uh, those kinds of small Differences in uses of punctuation are quite, quite common. Uh, just one more example here about a gender difference. A student in my class, his name was Matt, decided for an assignment to compare text messages he got from his father and text messages he got from his mother. And he decided he would look at 20 messages from each one. Now, he discovered a difference right at the start in order to collect 20 messages from his mother, he had to go back three weeks. 
In order to collect 20 messages from his father, he had to go back six months. <laughs> so his mother was texting him far more often than the father did. Uh, but I'll show you two examples where he looked side by side at how first his father, then his mother texted about the same uh, situation. The situation here is that he was expecting them to visit. They were at the airport and the plane, plane was delayed. So the father said, uh, good to something, and then that was an earlier message. American Airlines flight 3421, running late, due in at 945. And Matt replied, sounds good. His mother also texted, hi, honey, dot, 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 at the airport, RDU, that's Raleigh Durham, dot, dot, dot. Delayed till 8.45, period. Due into DC at 10 p.m., period. I'll keep you posted, heart, kissy face. <laughs> and his response was the same, sounds good. <laughs> so you see a lot of things going on with his mother. Again, the use of dot, 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 which he knows she didn't mean it to undercut what she said, but that's what it would mean. Using periods at the end of sentences, which kids wouldn't mean but more talk, more verbiage, and enthusiasm markers. Um, the heart, the kissy face. Uh, the next two that I'll show you were their uh, ways of responding. He had just gotten his driver's license, and they both texted about it. Dad, man, did you get your license? Yes, sir, got it yesterday. Mom, hey, Matt, dot, dot, dot. What do you think of your driver's license pick? Question mark, question mark. Are you happy with it? Ha ha, yep, I'm happy with it. I love it. <laughs> Caps, multiple exclamation points, three thumbs up, and a big smile. <laughs> uh, and this is often how emojis are used as, a, as markers of enthusiasm. Um, this is very much like what I wrote about in the book You Just Don't Understand, the book I wrote way back in the 90s about differences that tend to characterize women's and men's uses of language. And, and I, and I used, developed the terms there of report talk versus rapport talk. Report talk being a focus mostly on whatever the information is that you want to get across, and rapport talk where you add extra words to focus on the positive feelings of the relationship. And that very much characterizes this, that a lot of what the mother was doing was a kind of rapport talk a lot of what the father was doing was report talk, just getting uh, the message across. So those are my examples of these kinds of um, markers that we use to communicate how we mean what we say, what are the meta messages we have in mind when we communicate. Um, and sometimes the fact that those meta messages are not there can create quite a bit of confusion. The taciturnity of messages can create in itself confusion. A, a young woman in my class made a comment in discussion one time. She said, I am sick and tired of seeing relationship after relationship break up because the girls send these long chatty texts and they get one word responses. There, it was rapport talk versus report talk. But this was a, a, a text um, message that one of the women wrote a field note about. It was a message that had been received by a friend of hers from a boy that she liked, and the message said, hey. And now I'll read you what the student wrote about it. She said, about the girl who received the text. She wondered, what did he mean, hey? Did he really mean just, hey? Was he checking to see if she was busy? Was he actually interested in her like she was interested in him? Was he bored? How should she respond? Should she assume that there was something implied by his text? Address, address the frame of the conversation or just respond on the message level he had set up? Um, and she described how all the group of friends spent about 10 minutes discussing <laughs> what this young man probably meant by hey and how she should respond. And I was quite amused reading this, wondering, did the young man realize that whatever response he got had actually been composed by a committee? <laughs> but I got a lot of examples like that. A girl spent a lot of time 
looking at each other's text messages, deciding what they mean, talking about what would be an appropriate response, um, especially if it had to do with uh, romantic relationships or potential uh, romantic relationships. The one thing they could not do is ask him what he meant by hey. <laughs> <laughs> because when something is indirect, you can't make somebody be direct about it. Uh, and here's a rather similar example that was written up in a field note by a young man that a friend of his, again, you know, there's a guy that his friend liked, young woman, uh, and uh, this, this guy that she liked had put a link on a page of hers to a song with romantic lyrics. And she wondered, did this mean that he's trying to communicate that he has romantic feelings toward him, toward her? Uh, so she asked him, you know, what, are you trying to say something? And he replied, uh, no, I just like the song. I don't think that means he necessarily just liked the song. <laughs> if he sent it as a song because he didn't feel comfortable saying it outright, he wouldn't feel comfortable saying it outright when she asks him either. So there's really no way to know the answer to that one. Switching to the message level doesn't work. Some communication you just have to read on the meta message level. Um, I want to talk now about some of the um, possibilities, capabilities, and, and, and opportunities for creativity when conversations are held on these screens, but also some of the liabilities. And some of the liabilities are the same as the ones we have in face-to-face -face conversation, and some are particular to the medium. Uh, and here's one. Have you ever gotten an email where your name is in a line, a CC line among other names? Do you ever pay attention to where your name is in the list? <laughs> Two women that I was interviewing for my book about friends, and they were good friends, and I was talking to them together. One of them made a comment about that, and this is what she said. She said, you feel special when you're the first one on there, and you feel not special when you're the last one. Because if you're dead last, it's like they were thinking, who am I forgetting? And then we discussed, well, you could try to correct for that by putting the names on the BCC line so nobody can see what names are there. Uh, and she said, yeah, but if you do that, it looks like you're inviting all of Northwest Washington. Because if you're using BCC, you must have so many names on there. Um, one of the women made a very interesting observation. Uh, she worked in a real estate firm, and she said she had gotten a message at work. She was on the CC line. Her name was first. She had this momentary you know, feeling of pleasure. Isn't that nice? I'm first. She happened to be in, a friend's, in a, the office of another colleague and saw the same message on her screen. And on her screen, the recipient's name was first. And she realized that there was a program that put first the name of whoever is receiving the message. <laughs> but you don't know that that's what they're doing, so you would overinterpret and think that it means that the person who wrote it thought of you first. Um, another liability of communications on screen, it's a kind of enforced overhearing. It's a little bit like you're in a bathroom, you're behind the door in a stall with the door closed, and there are people sitting up front, sitting outside, or talking outside, and they're talking about you, because they don't know you're there and they don't know you're hearing them. It's a kind of enforced overhearing, and it can be pretty, pretty unsettling. There are situations using uh, email or, or texting and all these other multiple recipient um, media where you end up overhearing things that were really not intended for you. And it can happen a lot of different ways. Uh, sometimes it's using reply all and losing track of who is on that reply all list and saying things you think you're saying to one person, but you're actually overheard by many more. Um, sometimes it's forwarding things without really remembering what's down further on that thread, and the person you forwarded to sees things you don't think they should see, or simply sending it to the wrong person. I think we've probably done all of those things. But enforced overhearing can be used strategically, and I was very intrigued by this um, example that a student of mine explained. She said she had gone to a high school that was highly competitive. 
And all her friends, her group of women friends in this high school, uh, knew which colleges others had applied to. And when they got into a college, and it was their first choice college, and they were going to go, they put their status of what their plans are, but it let people know they had gotten into this good college. So for example, Georgetown class of 2019. This is also announcing to the friends that she got into Georgetown. Now, the student wrote in her field note, she faced a dilemma. She had applied to a number of competitive colleges. She had gotten into all of them, which she was rather proud of, but she hadn't decided which one to go to. Now, she would have liked to let her friends know, but she didn't feel she could. For example, you can't put a status like this, accepted at Georgetown, that's boasting. You can't do that, that's not, would not have been okay. But if she didn't do anything, all her friends knew that the colleges had sent out their acceptances. So if she didn't post any, they would all think she didn't get in anywhere. So how did she solve it? She had her sister post this message. Congrats on UVA acceptance, so proud of you. She wasn't posting, it was her sister who put it up there. But her friends could overhear from her sister's congratulations that she had been accepted. So I was intrigued by that creative use of the affordances of these social media uh, in ways that they uh, perhaps were not intended to be used but had turned out to be very useful. Um, I want to say something now about the something I referred to in the beginning. And, a sense of um, scorn and criticism that I sometimes perceive, especially among older people, but also some younger people, toward the use of social media. Uh, there was one woman that I was interviewing, she was in her 80s, uh, and she said, she was talking about this, how, how destructive she thought all this social media are, uh, and she said, all that stuff out there that nobody needs to know, I don't care what somebody had for dinner. And I was intrigued by that because what I was hearing from women friends was how much they appreciated a friend to whom they could say what they had for dinner. Uh, in fact, last night I quoted someone who said about someone, she's not that good a friend, I wouldn't tell her what I had for dinner. <laughs> it's that end of the day conversation where you know somebody cares about the details of your life and that's a positive thing. I think a lot of what we see on social media are, um, Things that we would do with close friends, but it's now possible to do to a larger number of people. And I think that's what results in a feeling that it's insincere. And I don't think it necessarily is, quote, insincere, but it's rather using more widely something that you may have expected to be used more narrowly. Uh, so sending a food, pictures of food would be one example. Um, it's, it's kind of a feeling that people are with you when they're not with you. There's a, a phrase that is sometimes used, it's absent presence, a sense of presence of people who are not physically there. Um, so the ability to send pictures or um, send texts telling what you're up to gives a sense of connection to people who aren't there. Maybe in the past, if they were there, you would elbow them and say, hey, look at that. So now they're not there, you take a picture and it's like saying, hey, look at that. Um, a woman that I interviewed, and again, I'll, I'll mention she was a physician, a uh, professional woman, um, told me that she's busy now, she has kids at home, she doesn't have time to shop with friends that she used to really enjoy shopping with. So what she will do is, if she sees something online, she'll take a picture of it, send the link to her friend, and send, ask the question, frumpy or fabulous? And she said, I'll imply that I'm thinking of buying it and I need her opinion. Is it frumpy or fabulous? If we were shopping together, that's what you would do. You'd get her opinion about something you're considering buying. And then she said, I know I'm not gonna buy it. But by sending it, I tell her I'm thinking of her. It's a way of saying we're still connected even though we don't have time to see each other. So I think this ability to create more connection over social media is, is really a very powerful and very positive thing. However, it also has a downside, and here's one of the downsides. Um, and I mentioned last night, 
there's a common expression, F-O-M-O, -O, FOMO, fear of missing out, uh, which explains why we're always checking our phones, make sure we don't miss something important that we should know about. And, and I devised the acronym FOBLO, F-O-B-L-O, fear of being left out, which is worse. Um, and as I said last night, with FOMO, you miss the party because you didn't check your phone in time. With FOBLO, you miss the party because you weren't invited and that hurts. When you think about it, every single person that you know is doing something without you when you're not there. <laughs> but you don't have to know that, and you don't have to think about it. But if they're constantly posting pictures of where they are and what they're doing, you have to think about it. And it's very intriguing to me. Um, I often talk about how and things are, have, have more than one meaning and can have different meanings to different people. So a student of mine wrote a field note. She was one of three sisters. The sisters were very close. And she had all these examples of how if two of the sisters were together, they would take a picture and send it to the third one so she would feel included. And I thought, I don't want to see pictures of what my two sisters are doing when I'm not there because it's gonna make me feel left out. So I think different people react differently to these things. Um, but putting these pictures up without being asked means you're subjected to seeing what everybody's doing and there is that risk of feeling left out. Another um, dilemma that exists in face-to-face -face communication as well is the question, what's real and what's fake? And I know the issue of fake news is very current now. But when you think about it, this has always been an issue in our lives. People tell you things, is it true or not? They could be mistaken, they could be intentionally saying something that's not true. When you see things online, what's true and what's not? And I think it makes it particularly challenging. Uh, there's a phrase that people sometimes use, that again my students told me about, no pics didn't happen. Which they say to each other to mean, send us a picture. If you really want me to believe it happened, send me a picture. Uh, but what's really interesting about that is sometimes a picture can be deceiving. Just because it's a picture doesn't mean that it really happened. Uh, this is something one young woman I interviewed for the book about friends commented to me. She said, I get a phone call from one of my friends saying she had a terrible time at this party and she wishes she hadn't gone. Then I'll get off the phone and check Instagram, and I'll see a picture of her smiling and having fun at the party, which if I didn't just have that conversation with her, I would think I was missing the party of the century. So when you think about it, the pictures that people put up are often always cheerful, always smiling, always acting like they're having a great time and they may not be having a great time, but when you see them there, you think they are, and you might feel left out. Uh, another young woman told me that she put up a picture of herself at a party. Her boyfriend got angry at her because there was a, a guy behind her that he really didn't like. And she said she hadn't even talked to the guy at the party, but he was there in the picture. So her boyfriend got the wrong impression. So pictures can be actually quite uh, misleading. Another liability with conversations over social media is that norms are changing so quickly. And things that some people think are quite appropriate, others think are not appropriate at all. Do any of you uh, sign off messages with X's and O's? A friend of mine was telling me how much she hates that. She thinks it's terrible, it's not, a, it's, she said, um, oh, it doesn't mean anything, it's just keys to hit. And I said, why is that just keys to hit and the word love is not just keys to hit? Just assumptions of, that she has in connection with that. And when she said that, I started feeling really nervous because I use XOXO sometimes. And it's really difficult to, uh, to know what is gonna be approved of and what is not gonna be approved of by other people. Um, two friends, actually quite close friends, were telling me that they have been really good friends in, in high school. They're now, uh, they went to college together and they're now living in different cities. And uh, one of them was really pretty upset with the other because she was texting 
things that were bothering her, really, you know, intimate things that she would have talked to her friend about. And she was getting very minimal responses. Well, they talked about it, and the friend said she really didn't think texting was appropriate for those kinds of interchanges. So good friends, same age, but different assumptions about what's appropriate and what's not appropriate over particular media. Um, I have two sisters, as I just mentioned. One is very comfortable talking about personal things. The other is less so. Uh, one time I was talking to that sister on the phone, and we had a nice conversation, and we hung up, and then I opened email, and she told me about something really significant that had been going on in her life. So I answered on email, we just talked on the phone, why didn't you mention it? And she said, the telephone is so impersonal. <laughs> and at first this sounded illogical to me. Isn't email impersonal? Isn't the phone personal? You hear the voice. But we talked about it. Uh, and she explained, when you're writing email, it's like you're writing in a journal. It's just you and the screen and your thoughts. And many people find it easier to express that way something intimate than they would with a person facing them. That person facing you is sort of makes you uncomfortable. It's like they're bearing down on you. Uh, and there are many examples of that. Um, the whole question about whether using Social media is more intimate or less intimate. Um, here's, a, here's a cartoon from The New Yorker that shows the view that it is less intimate. So two guys at a bar, and one says to the other, I used to call people, and then I got into emailing, and then texting, and now I just ignore everyone. <laughs> so clearly he thinks using social media is less personal. You get further and further away from people until you might as well just write them off entirely. But my students gave me many examples of how people could say things through texting that they wouldn't say that were more intimate. For example, a young man whose mother was born in the Philippines. And he said his mother never said, I miss you. She would say, dad misses you. She would say, we miss you. But then they started texting, and she would write, I miss you. And he was very touched by that. And it was more intimate given social media. Here's another one. Um, I think many people feel quite strongly that condolence notes should not be written on email. That is something that really requires handwritten notes. And when Robin said, have any of you recently written something, I wouldn't be surprised if it was a condolence note. That is something that people do write. And yet, um, one woman that I talked to commented that she appreciated condolence notes she got by email even more. What she said is, they're wonderfully comforting. I feel no obligation to respond, and in general, they're more feeling and less stilted than what people write on cards. Another example about how using social media can actually be more intimate rather than less. Um, and some of you may know uses of things like caring bridge and other, or group emails. Uh, and this is a way that I think social media can be extremely useful. Um, again, I talked yesterday about the requirement that many women in particular have that you have to tell friends what's going on. They need to know what's going on in your life or they're going to feel uh, uh, that you've let them down. Well, if you're going through a crisis, having to tell one person after another about what's going on can really be exhausting. So if you can use social media, either group emails or a caring bridge, it, it is a much more effective way to do that. But um, I want to conclude with what I think is maybe the most significant, in my view, one of the most significant ways that social media and communication over so social media have changed our lives and our world. There's a way that I think it's a totally different way of being in the world. In the past, the default situation is that you're alone. Unless there's a person in front of you or someone comes in your, in your sphere physically, maybe calls on the phone, maybe even, maybe even you receive a letter. If it's not one of those things, you're basically alone. I have increasingly perceived, especially from my students, but maybe all of us too, that they're never alone, 
they are always in an open state of communication. If they are not available for texting, they need to let their friends know, I'm not going to be available. Because the default case is you are available. Your friends can get through to you at any time. Again, this sense of absent presence. And I think that's a very different way of being in the world. Being alone can have very different meanings. It can be lonely. And I think that's one of the wonderful things about social media. I think there's a lot less loneliness because you can be in communication with people who aren't there. But what you have less of is solitude. And solitude can be a very positive thing. So you know, soul-searing loneliness or soul-saving solitude. And we have to work harder to get the solitude, whereas in the past, we had to work harder to get the sense that we're in communication with people. So that is what I think is really one of the major differences. Um, so I'm going to end. I just have one more example that I'm going to end with. Um, and it's another example of how some of the liabilities of these social media are actually built into the medium itself. Again, an example brought in by a student. Uh, this was a texting exchange between his 13-year-old brother and one of their cousins, also a 13-year-old a girl. And this is how it went. Uh, she sent him a message, hi, what's up? And he sent her a message, nothing much, what's up with you? Saints suck. Oh, you're upset about the football game. They lived in New Orleans, so, you know, the New Orleans Saints. Oh, you're upset about the football game. Yeah, I am. Saints suck. You already said that. What do you mean? Saints suck. <laughs> are you beginning to figure out what's going on? You said it again. What are you talking about? Saints suck. <laughs> oh, it's your signature. <laughs> Many of us have signatures on our email. He apparently had a program that put a signature on his texting, and he forgot. What's my signature? Saints suck. <laughs> Never mind, gotta go, mom's here. Bye, Saint Suck. <laughs> so I'll end with that because it encapsulates, I think, in a, in a somewhat simplified way, but we do have a whole extra set of liabilities that we have to be attuned to where meta messages that get sent might not be the ones we intended, and we might be missing meta messages that are intended. So I'll stop there. Thank you. I think we have time for questions. Yeah, we have time for questions, and if people will come up to the mic and ask their questions there. I'm I relate to everything that you're saying about younger people, and I uh, work in, uh, happen to be an architectural firm, but I'm curious of how it translates from uh, going, getting out of school, going into the business world, and how they, or how do you relate that difference for business communications that's now broader, more generations sort of across the line, and what that means, or, or the, the misunderstandings that now yes, can occur, absolutely. as well as being inappropriate in a way. Yes, I do have a lot to say about that. Um, yes, I have heard a lot about the confusion that people confront. Again, because there are such different assumptions about what's appropriate and how you use it. And so many people ask me, I often get asked advice, and I say, I don't, I don't give tips, I don't know. But <laughs> I get asked, is it appropriate to use smiley faces in the workplace? Is it appropriate to use exclamation points in the workplace? Some people think it is, some people think it isn't. Um, and I'll give you one example that I think is, is pretty chastening. Um, I've written a lot about what I call the double bind, that um, women in, the, in positions of authority face a double bind, that is two requirements 
either of which, if, if they, both of which they have to fulfill, but anything they do to fulfill one violates the other. And this is something that Robin Lakoff wrote about years before I did. Um, but in the workplace, and I found this in a book I wrote, and I write about this in a book I wrote about the workplace called Talking from Nine to Five, Women and Men at Work. I looked at women in the highest positions of authority in the workplaces where I did my research. Uh, and if they were using language in a way that was authoritative, they were often not liked. If they were using language in a way that you expected of women, they were often underestimated. A woman that I interviewed actually for the Friends book happened in the course of our discussion to give me this example. She, I don't know, a few years out of college, she's got a job, there's an intern assigned to her in the workplace, young man, uh, and she worked with him and was training him and they seemed to be having a nice relationship. And uh, after they'd been working together for a few months, they had one of these conversations we often have, what did you think of me when you first met me, you know? And he said, I thought you were a bitch. <laughs> and she said, why? And he said, your emails. They were just right to the point. No exclamation points, no smileys. He had come to expect that from women. And because she hadn't done it, uh, and that's something I often say that women in the workplace know that one false move and there's this word bitch, you know, that's always hovering here and one false move, it's stuck on us. Um, so her comment to me was that she said to him, welcome to the world of work. But I was thinking it's also welcome to the world of work to her, the double bind that she was uh, subjected to. So yes, this all presents new challenges in the workplace. Have these sorts of communications, foibles and conundrums attended every uh, technological shift onto a new communications platform? I'm thinking back as far as uh, Telegraph and, and Morse code, would it have, you know, you wrote dot, dot, did you leave out a dash? Um, can you? I'm sorry, of, so your question is, yeah. Just um, if these sorts of uh, scrutiny and, and clarifications around communication have attended every oh, migration I, yes, onto yes, a new yes, yes. communication platform. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and something I have to say that Robin has written about very eloquently, at every stage, there's a hue and cry these new media are destroying communications. And you know, you know the details more than I do, but was it Aristotle that was complaining about writing or? <laughs> was, I, yeah, I can't hear. You wanna to go to the, to the microphone and tell us? You won't remember. Um, Socrates was kind of the last generation of Athenians uh, who were not expected to be literate. And he sort of uh, glorified this into, uh, you know, I teach people things by talking. And so uh, he had a kind of theory that he would articulate from time to time about how if you, um, if you put something in writing, if, if you become dependent on writing, that is, you don't, count, you don't, you don't use your memory anymore, uh, you will not be Greek anymore because you won't have that thing in your head, you will have to go to the library and get it. Or you'll have to Silly. go to Google and get it. So, uh, you know, he, he was, he felt, you know, he professed, you know, there's this Socratic irony, you never know. He professed to be frightened of literacy. I have a sneaky feeling in my mind that he knew perfectly well how to read and write. This was just a bunch of shtick. You know, he was so good at it. But anyway, yeah. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Quite parallel. You know, kids are gonna be ruined because they're doing this. They should be talking face to face. And Socrates thinking, you're all gonna be ruined because you're writing. You should use your heads. So yeah, I think there's always this fear of the new. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much. I've been such a fan of yours from your PhD thesis oh, on. thank you so much. And you've made an incredible difference in my life as a New Yorker living here. <laughs> an expatriate New Yorker. Now I don't get, I'm losing my sense of sarcasm when I go to New York. But at any rate, you said that you could lecture a, a lot more on ha-ha, and uh, I'm a little confused about ha-ha and LOL with my younger uh, friends. 
Yes, yeah, so I have my students bring in every instance they encounter of some variation of laughter. Uh, one thing is clear, LOL does not mean laughing. It can mean all kinds of other things, but it's not laughter. Um, and various versions of ha, 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 the number of ha's that you have, um, often just means I don't mean what I said literally. It doesn't mean I'm literally laughing, it means I don't mean it seriously. Don't take this at face value. Um, and this was also gender differences. So they brought in, in my class, this class is mostly women, but it had a number of young men in the class, and they had written on the board all the things that they um, had la laughter. And I said, are there any others we've missed? And this young man got up and he puts L-M-A-O, laughing my ass off, <laughs> and then all kinds of things with the letter F in it, <laughs> which the girls didn't use, but the guys did. So yeah, there were gender differences. But a lot of it, I think it basically comes down to, do I mean what I say literally, or do I want you to realize that I'm saying it tongue in cheek? And that's the big, that's the big challenge with uh, seeing things on the screen. You know, you can, teasing, you can be insulted. It can happen face to face too. Somebody means it to be teasing and you take it literally and you're offended, but it's a real risk there. And, and equally so with the LOL and the ha 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 ha. Well, the LOL, yeah, <laughs> the LOL, of course, was one of the first ones that I was pointed out to me as a gender difference. Um, so you know, a, a, a young woman writes about something terrible that's bothering her, and her mother writes sympathy and then says LOL, by which the mother meant lots of love. But you don't say lots of, you don't say laughing out loud. Uh, for the kids, LOL was laughing out loud. But I think it has morphed and it isn't really about laughter anymore. It's just um, one more way to signal, don't take this literally. Hi. Hi. Um, thanks so much for speaking, first of all. Um, I guess a question I have is, well, I have two, but I'll just do the first one first and then we'll see. Um, so I did a project um, on speech in people, well, I guess corpus, the corpus of Tinder biographies of millennials. Corpus of what? Tinder biographies, like the dating app. Yeah, yeah. And one of the biggest challenges I had was that there's so much visual information in people's photographs and in emoji use. And so I guess I was wondering, you mentioned the use of sort of, um, emojis, emoticon, bitmoji, memes, and how do you like compensate for that or accommodate for that when so much of corpus linguistics analysis is so like quantitative, which is part of why I like it because it's, it's quite easy to sift through things, but when images come into play, it really kind of messes with my data. <laughs> and so I guess the question would be, how do you accommodate for that in doing your work? Yeah, uh, corpus linguistics is a very, very burgeoning field right now. Right. Uh, and it's an amazing capability. Mm -hmm. You can get millions of words, data, and find answers that you know. You know, I give you examples from a couple of people. You gotta take my word for it that this is more widespread. And I trust you, you know, does it ring true? If it rings true, maybe there's something to it. If you say, I've never seen anything like that, maybe I got a weird example. Mm. So corpus linguistics is great that way. But I don't think it, it is, capable of identifying these um, subtleties. So I think we need both. Mm. Uh, there are certain kinds of questions that can be addressed that way and others that can't. I guess my concern is there's a tendency to do the things you can do. And I, that's my one concern that as corpus linguistics and computational methods become more and more widespread, we won't be asking the questions that have to be answered this way. Mm. Uh, you, know, you could call it a case study method or right. microanalysis, but I think we need both. Mm. And then I guess perhaps this, you've just answered this potentially, but I guess do you think that um, the changes you've seen, like the one you just described with LOL, initially meaning I'm actually laughing to meaning just sort of I'm amused, um, do you think there's any sort of language change analyses that can be applied to the corpus of text-based speech. What a great question, what a great question. Maybe you'll figure one out. <laughs> <laughs> I just, it uh, you can ask questions like, fast. where does it appear? Mm. And this is something that has been done uh, that they tend to appear where, punctu where um, 
punctuation would have appeared in the past. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, LOL and ha 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 are just like punctuation because you don't put a period at the end, but you put ha ha at the end or LOL at the end, and it functions a bit like like punctuation. So you can ask computationally, where does it appear? You could ask, I guess, what sorts of verbs does it appear after? You can ask questions like that. Okay. And, I actually noted what something that similar in my Tinder biography thing. <laughs> I found that people used emojis in place of a period. Yeah. So. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. This Hello. Was, this was quite wonderful. Um, so um, I'm thinking about intimacy and what. Can you talk louder? I get the mic closer. Um, thinking about intimacy. So I'm a therapist as well as other things. And so I think a lot about that. And it, it's a theme in what you were describing that is intriguingly deep and complex about what represents intimacy. And as I was standing waiting, I was reminded of Marshall McLuhan's Cool and Warm Media years ago. What was the last thing? Uh, Marshall McLuhan's Cool Media and Warm Media. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, and these new technological ones seem to be cooler media, not necessarily less intimate, different. So if we choose to be more available, which means texting, what does that mean? Does that mean I'm being more available or less available? If I choose to do a phone call because I can talk now, but I can't do FaceTime because there's other stuff, is that being more intimate or less intimate? And there's so much room because there's less data for misinterpretation on the one hand, or for potentially for connection because I'm more involved, like the hey, right? Uh, the recipient of hey has to spend much more time trying to understand who that person is and what they're communicating than if it were going on in person. So for those of us of my generation, it's interesting to think about the subtleties of it. A, B, in doing therapy, um, I do have, as many of us probably have, the experience of someone talking to me about their relationship and this terrible argument that they had with their boyfriend or girlfriend where she said this and I said that and I couldn't believe she said this and so I said that and it takes me a while to get it that this was all texting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? And, uh, and uh, so, thank you. So th any thoughts about the complexity of uh, intimacy in the new world? Yes, yes, uh, and all these observations are very um, significant and helpful. Um, I guess the one thing I would say is that there's no one answer that it can be done. It can be as a kind of like what I said, it can be more intimate and it can be less intimate. Yeah, it's a cool medium, but Marshall McLuhan was thinking of television. These things go right into your face. And in a way, what could be more intimate than that? You, you could be in the most personal situation and here's this message right there. Um, and, and it can be different things for different people. So I think the crucial thing is to look at how it is being used by these people in this context and, and ask, is it being more intimate or less intimate in this way? So some people maybe would find better communication if they occasionally backed off and texted or emailed. And other people have to just put that aside and just talk to each other face to face. And maybe it's doing it differently than you did it before. That might be some sort of a breakthrough. But I guess my strongest feeling is that there's no one way to look at it and to be really cautious about how we respond to other people's uses of these media because their sense of it may be different from ours. Thank you.